the bottom here um, with figures of standing individuals um, um, sort of standing and kind of displaying their, oh, their Where their did power. the beads come from? We think of beads being brought to this continent. Well, that's exactly right. We and, and one of the reasons why, people always wonder, why was the Native Americans were so enchanted with glass beads, which were produced in huge quantities in Vienna and in Europe. And people often are, are sort of saying, well, the Indians must have been stupid to have sold the island of Manhattan for some, for some glass beads, uh, or to trade with, the, with the, um, uh, the Spanish for glass beads. Well, the reason is <clears throat> that the glass beads they had were little tiny glass beads. They didn't know how glass was made. There was no glass in the Americas until the Euro Europeans came. They tried to, uh, the natives understood it in terms of their own technology. And what they knew is that it took an enormous amount of energy and effort to make a little tiny bead out of shell, much less to make it out of some shiny substance like glass. Um, and every single one of these little beads represents the use of a drill to cut out a tiny piece from a hard shell. So they're individually carved. Each one of them is individually carved. Good gracious. Um, and it's not just the, the object itself, but, but the execution of it that represents hundreds of hours of labor. Yeah. And this is one of the things that, um, you know, of course, anyone who appreciates fine objects knows something about the craftsmanship that goes into that. But if you're a carpenter, or if you're, a, even if you're, you make computers or whatever, you recognize quality and detail. Um, and it's understanding that these things were made by hand not machine made, every individual shell being shaped, um, uh, or every single bead being shaped from a shell. Um, this is another uh, necklace from South America made out of the shell. And the shell itself is called spondylus. Uh, this is what the shell itself looks like. Uh, it's a bright red uh, bivalve called the spiny oyster. <clears throat> it comes in two parts. Uh, and what's interesting about the, the, the spiny oyster is it's bright red which relates to blood and fertility, uh, and possibly also the monthly cycles of women that show their fertility. And it's a bivalve, so it's often interpreted as a female symbol. The other sacred shell was a univalve, uh, the conch shell. And the conch shell <coughs> was something that you could knock the end off of and make into a trumpet. Uh, and so the combination of the spondylus bivalve and the, and the conch shell was a sacred combination of male and female elements. Uh, and one of the objects in the exhibition is this ceramic uh, reproduction of a spondylus shell, a spiny oyster <coughs> shell, um, and a conch shell combined together into this beautiful drinking vessel. Uh, and here's some other examples of these shells. Now, these shells are only found <clears throat> in the warm tropical waters off the coast of um, Central and South America. They're also, the red variety, is found at a depth of about 80 to 100 feet. So the procurement of these shells were very similar to um, pearl diving. You actually had to have specialized divers who were willing to risk their lives and bring these shells out of the beds on the bottom of the sea and then work them. And actually, the only part of the shell that makes that red color <clears throat> is the surface and a, and a ring around the outside. So they don't even use the whole shell. <clears throat> they go for the red part. <clears throat> but these shells were sacred, sacred shells from Mexico all the way down to uh, the <coughs> capital of the Incas in Cusco. In fact, it's said that um, the, the, the emperor in Cusco would have shells brought to him um, from the coast, and that the Spanish were amazed that these shells were valued uh, more highly than gold. Um, and in some places of, uh, uh, on the north coast of Peru, uh, there was a, an emperor of, of a culture called the Chimu, who actually hired, had, had an assistant who would scatter shell dust uh, wherever he walked. Um, <laughs> almost like, but not quite, a, a red carpet. But it was laying out shell, red shell dust so that he could walk along on this sacred material as he was, as he was walking. Um, of course, gold is the luxury material par excellence. Uh, gold begins to be worked in South America in the, about a, uh, 1500 BC. Um, and the first way that it's worked is by making objects of sheet gold. Now, sheet gold is not an easy thing to make. <clears throat> it requires you to take nuggets of gold that come from panning, think about uh, placer mining or, or gold panning, 
taking nuggets and then working those nuggets together into a large enough piece that you can actually make a sheet out of it. Now this is as difficult, maybe even more so, than working shell because you're assembling a number of small nuggets into a single piece and this has to be done in a process that's called hammering and annealing. In fact, you can hammer the gold, but it becomes brittle because it develops micro cracks in it. You have to heat it in order to be able to hammer it some more. So there's a long, laborious process just in making the sheet gold, which then is worked by cutting it and shaping it. Uh, and this object, which dates to about 800 BC, um, this would be what it would be contemporaneous with. Um, roughly contemporary, well, somewhere between, um, somewhere between the time of the Trojan War and Homer writing it down <laughs> is when this was made. So this, this would have been contemporaneous with, with the Iliad and the Odyssey. Uh, this is what they were doing in Peru. And this is a golden crown made out of a single sh strip of gold. Uh, it was shaped by what's called repoussé, which is hammering the design in on one side, flipping it over and hammering other parts of it on the, on the other side. And it's actually decorated with five heads of these monsters, um, probably based on a crocodile uh, or some, some similar type of lizard. Uh, but this would have emphasized the power of the crocodile or lizard or monster in the individual who's, who's wearing this crown. Um, other objects that mm. echoed the same symbolism include this beautiful object. This is another crown. It's about that big, made out of a single sheet of gold mm. that would have been worn on top of the head. Um, and it represents a, a single standing figure with fangs, one of these menacing individuals, um, uh, showing the power of the king. Yeah? When you say a single sheet, is that made as a cylinder or is it somehow attached in the back? Yeah, it's a, it's, that's exact, what you describe is exactly right. It's a, cil it's a cylinder. It's made from a single flat sheet that is then curved around and fastened with wires in the back in order to make a cylinder that stands up on top, sort of like a chef's hat, uh, but made out of, made out of gold. Uh, this object over here is, is a headband. Uh, and actually, it's attached because, uh, by, by fastening it. It has these holes here and then two more holes on the interior. So it's just a single strip of gold that you wrap around uh, and then fasten uh, in the front. What's amazing to me is these three or 4,000 year old objects represent enormous technology from way, way, way back. These people had enormous capacity to manage gold and all that stuff. It's, it's amazing. That's absolutely true. What's also somewhat um, sobering yeah. is that these are just a handful of objects that have survived from what must have been an enormous corpus of them, um, many of which were ultimately co collected by the Spanish and melted down, obviously. Um, Oops. This would be a, a, a pectoral that would have been worn on the chest. And this little object here is a, is a spoon, probably for administering um, pharmaceuticals, uh, mm -hmm. of a little guy, a, a man who's sort of seated here on top of the spoon part, uh, and he's actually blowing on a little shell trumpet um, mm -hmm. in, in his hands. And the shell trumpet is made out of silver. The, the spoon itself is made out of gold. Uh, this is a wonderful object that was actually excavated by an archaeologist um, at um, an archaeological site called Dos Cabezas on the north coast of Peru. And this was found uh, in a tomb uh, with a young, uh, the tomb of a young man who was buried with a number of gold objects. Uh, and this may very well be a portrait of the person who was in the tomb. Uh, what's fascinating is that he's wearing this really spectacular headdress. Can you see what the headdress represents? It actually has, a, has an owl in the middle of it, so it's a bird head in the front. But these are all the tentals, tentacles of an octopus. Uh -huh. um, and he's wearing a necklace with little, with little jaguar beads around his neck. And we've actually found examples of these jaguar beads. But in a site not far from Dos Cabezas was found this object made out of sheep gold which represents something very similar to what it was that he was wearing on his head. So not only do we have ceramic objects that show individuals wearing jewelry, we have the objects that they were wearing themselves. Um, and the teeth are made out of shell. The eyes are made out of a blue stone. Uh, it's covered with bangles that would have shaken back and forth. All of, and then each of these uh, 
tentacles. It's not only a tentacle that kind of shows the suckers in a stylized way, but it ends in a little serpent head. So they're almost like tentacles and snakes coming all together uh, in, 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 in this object. Um, this was another object that came from the same tomb uh, as that seated figure. And it's one of the few ceramic objects that were in the show. The, the ceramics obviously are a very important medium. Um, but uh, one of the reasons this is such a wonderful object is the craftsmanship. It was all hand modeled. Um, and it represents an, a mythical creature, an imaginary creature, that's sort of like a combination of a, of a dog. Um, and it has kind of a, a mermaid-like tail <laughs> wrapping around behind it. Um, and then this right here is a, what's called a stirrup spout. Uh, this is actually a drinking vessel. What is the material? Ceramic, pottery, uh -huh. made out of pottery. Uh, and you would have probably put beer in it. It's probably a, a, a vessel for drinking beer. So was it molded? Well, that was what people originally thought because this culture actually made a lot of mold-made uh, ceramics. But this object was hand modeled. It was all completely made by hand, by oh, a master yeah. craftsman. And then fired. And then fired, yes, of course. Um, to give you a sense of the, of, of the shells, <clears throat> this is a ceramic uh, representation of shells, um, which are kind of sitting in a basket. And in fact, an archaeological excavation of a, um, of a pyramid in, uh, at a site in, in the north coast of Peru actually uncovered a well-preserved basket that has shells placed in it almost exactly the way that they've been placed uh, on this ceramic vessel. But you can see, these are those spiny oysters. Um, and then this is just a close-up to show you what that shell work looks like um, in terms of the, the creation of each individual flat shell um, bead um, in order to, to put into a, a necklace uh, and then to work them into what would be pectorals. And in some places, people are found with multiple examples of these. Um, this was just one example that was featured in the uh, exhibition. Um, at a site called um, El Brujo, uh, there was an excavation of a young woman um, who uh, was probably in her 20s or 30s. It was found that, uh, based on analysis of her, um, of, of, of her um, mummified body, that she had recently given birth and probably died in childbirth. And she's known as the Lady of Cow. And the Lady of Cow is, is kind of an interesting burial because she was found with 23 spear throwers. She was found with weapons that are normally associated with men. She was also wrapped in beautifully hand-woven cloths. And placed on her chest were a total of 32 nose ornaments, um, of which these are some examples, which are among the most unique objects in all of South American archaeology, because they, the designs that are found in them are found only in this one tomb. Now, there were 32 of them. These are two, or this is, these are two that happen to feature, see what the animals are? Crawfish. Crawfish or lobsters um, that are crafted in silver that has been um, welded to gold. And this little crescent up here, that's the functional part. That's where you hang it from your nose. Um, so these were nose ornaments, 32 no nose ornaments uh, crafted of silver and gold. Uh, with the Lady of Cal. Uh, this is another nose ornament. You recognize what the iconography is there or what the creature is that's being portrayed on here? It's one of my favorite pieces. It's only, it's only about that big. A beetle? No, a spider. spider. Well, it's a spider. spider. That's right. It's, 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 got, it's got, actually, it, it only has, uh, it has eight legs. Okay, two, four, six, eight. Okay. They're little pinchers on the front of the face. Each one of these was hammered individually. And then each of these little gold rings was attached and welded one by one in order to create this object, which is only about that big, which would have been used to place within the nose as a nose ornament. Um, this is one nice, nice example for Halloween. <laughs> you know, if you wanted a Halloween costume, it was pretty cool. You would wear this nose or ornament in the shape of a bat. Bats are magical creatures. They echolocate. They can fly in the dark and avoid obstacles. Um, they're also they're, 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 they're associated with the nighttime and therefore are mysterious. And, and, and one, that's one of the reasons we associate it with Halloween. Uh, but this was another one of those uh, uh, wonderful um, 
um, nose ornaments that was found uh, in, in this burial. Um, and um, any idea why people would wear nose ornaments like this? And obviously the nose is an important place that you can hang things from. Um, yep. To hide bad teeth? Well, to hide bad teeth would be one possibility, but we know from the skeletons in this area that actually their teeth were in pretty good shape. They probably had better teeth than we had, but teeth are the clue. One of the characteristics of these cultures is the idea that people, by wearing these ornaments, by wearing this jewelry, could transform themselves into animals or into magical beings. And those magical beings had fangs. This is something that we know from representations in the artwork, these fanged beings. Well, when you're wearing a nose ornament of a bat or whatever that covers your mouth, nobody can tell that you don't have fangs. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so as, 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 as tyrants and rulers and other people in power do all the time, they create their own truth. No kidding. Uh -huh. And if they tell you that they have fangs, and you can't tell that they don't, it's sort of like you can't tell that they didn't kill that guy. In the uh -huh. <laughs> so you, you wind up believing them, and it becomes part of the magic of creating this illusion of that rulers have fangs. Um, this one is a little bit hard to make out because it's so dark, but this is actually not a nose ornament. Anyone want to guess what this is? Another part of the beautiful uh, objects that were made by the Moche culture of Peru. It's actually a rattle. Uh, it's been shaped by two pieces of gold that are then folded over, and along the bottom edge are these hollow spherical shapes, each of which has a small clay pellet inside of it. Oh. So all of these objects together rattle. It's part of a dance costume oh. that someone would wear as they were as they were dancing. But what it features on it is one of these fanged individuals who's not wearing a nose ornament, so you can actually see his fangs. And in one of his hands, he's holding a big axe. And you want to guess what he's holding in his other hand? He's holding a severed human head by the hair. This is the, this is the decapitator god standing there, decorated on, on a rattle that would have been part of the costume of, 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 the, of, the, uh, of the ruler. Would that um, be worn by a shaman? Well, the term shaman is probably too narrow for what oh. this person was. They probably were a warrior. They probably were um, a ruler, oh. somebody with political power, oh. Oh. and also somebody with magical power. Oh. So oh. all of those things were, were went together. And the objects that they wore were part of showing, showing that power. Mm -hmm. uh, these are some examples of, you want to guess what these objects are? Golden jade Right. Well, they're turquoise? golden turquoise, but how do you think they might have been worn? Not in the nose, not ears? in the belt. Yeah. That's right, ears. Yeah. These are ear ornaments. Mm. Uh, and you still see you see people walking around on Massachusetts Street today who have gauged their earlobes big enough to be able to put these things in. But these were ear ornaments that would have been worn on the ears. Each of these was part of a matched pair. This one decorated with little lizards. This one decorated with a deer with inlay made out of chrysocolla, and they're only about that big. And each of these little beads was attached individually by being welded to the outside mm -hmm. of this. The What's level this? of craftsmanship in making these objects is just mind-blowing. What's the stone on the right? The stone is called chrysocolla, which is sometimes referred to as, a, as an Andean turquoise. Oh. Uh, it's actually a, a mineral that's related to, min uh, it's, it's chemically related to turquoise, uh, and has a similar uh, blue turquoise color. This is one of my favorites of these oh ear flares. This was one of a matched pair uh, that were associated with an uh, individual known as the Lord of Sipan, uh, dating to the third century AD, roughly contemporaneous with, the, with Const uh, Constantine. Uh, at the same time that Constantine was doing his thing in Rome, uh, this is what the Lord of Sipan was doing in Peru. And this is, this is uh, one of a, a matched set of ear flares that were found in the spectacular tomb at uh, the site of C uh, uh, Sipan in, in Peru. Um, and I just wanted to show you the, the amount of detail on this. The object is only that big. It's only about three inches in diameter. But you can see a standing warrior. Remember that rattle that I showed you? He's wearing those around his waist, oh. those little bitty rattles. Uh, he's holding a, 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 
a club in one hand. He's holding a small shield in the other hand. Around his neck is a series of beads in the shape of small owl heads, which have been strung not just with one piece of wire, but with two pieces of wire that go through each one. Um, he has um, a headdress with a large kind of axe-shaped object on top of it, but you can see the details of his face, his eyes, and he's actually wearing little ear flares. Here are little ear flares like the big ear flare that the, the, the guy he's Where do these folks get their magnifying glasses? <laughs> it's, a, it's really pretty incredible. It's amazing. Um, but if you look closely, he's wearing a nose ornament which is actually hanging from the septum of his nose and wiggles back and forth and actually moves. Um, this is just a close-up to give you a, 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 a view of this. But this level of craftsmanship cannot be reproduced today. You could not find a jeweler on the planet who would be able to make something at this level of detail. One of the most highly crafted objects ever made um, in the Americas or in, or in the world. And it was part of a matched pair. <laughs> Uh, which, which is really pretty amazing. Um, this is also quite amazing. This was actually one of a series of ten beads made out of hammered gold that were found uh, on the chest of a, of a priest, also at the site of Sipan. Um, can you see what this creature is? It's a small bead. It's about that big. It's kind of a hollow bead. It's also a rattle in that it has a ceramic ball inside that's shaped so it would have been part of a dance costume. This is a, a, a face, but the human face is on the back of a spider. And the spider is sitting in the middle of a web oh. made out of gold wires. And each of those gold wires is attached to the front <coughs> part of this gold circle. And then it also fits onto a back that, that is decorated as well. And it was part of a matched set of 10 of these objects uh, that date to, again, about third century AD. Um, that young man that I mentioned who was, who was buried in the tomb with the, um, uh, the, the, the seated uh, ceramic figure was also buried with this beautiful mask made out of a combination of copper um, and gold with decorations of shell and also uh, black stone for the eyes. Uh, and you can see how they have kind of de depicted his golden beard. Uh, a really beautiful presentation. You can get this kind of haunting look on the face of this of this person, probably a representation of the person in the tomb. Yes? So the green is copper with a patina? That's correct. That's right. Um, this is a, a hammered ornament that would have been part of a headdress uh, in the shape of a uh, kind of a jaguar-like face with two birds flanking on either side. Here's a bird with its feet and its wings coming up behind. And then a big